Welcome to the last of five video lectures on Shakespeare's tragedy, Hamlet. So act five, the last act of Hamlet, last act of the play, opens in a graveyard. And we have two grave digger characters talking, digging a grave and, and talking about, about the grave that they're digging, right? Um, and these are, especially the, the one grave digger, grave digger number one, is a really witty, smart, interesting character. Uh, grave digger two is more just a foil. Uh, if we're grave digger one, he's he's a little less less witty. And and what makes the first this grave digger character so interesting? He's really the only character we're going to meet in the play who can match wits with Hamlet. Uh, and it, it, there's a lot of fun that comes as a result of this. And that that fun, witty wordplay, which is humorous and silly and and fun then really sharply contrasts to the fact we're in a graveyard um, and the fact that we're uh, looking at a, a scene that's also um, a funeral. So, all right, let, let's jump right into the text. So the first grave digger, uh, Ham Hamlet is not on scene yet. He'll be here soon, along with Horatio. Um, but first, the grave diggers are talking. Uh, the first grave digger says, Is she to be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? Uh, we're going to find out later. We know before Hamlet knows who, who this is to be buried. The she is, is Ophelia. Remember, Ophelia died. She drowned. As we learned, it happens off stage. We don't see it on stage. But Gertrude reported, us, reported to us, to the audience and to the king and to Laertes back in Act 4 that she had, had died by drowning, right? Um, and and uh, most... Uh, readers also read that as suicide, as does the grave digger here, that she died by suicide. And I asked you in the, the previous video lecture to think about that. Uh, I think it's an interesting conversation. I think I think the the best reading is probably is that she died by suicide, but I do think it's an interesting conversation whether she died a different way or not, if she, she died by accident. I've seen even a production where... Uh, Gertrude was involved in, the, in in her death that actually makes it a murder. I don't really buy that reading, or I, I don't dislike it, um, but it's a, a different kind of reading. Um, the, the predominant reading, though, is she dies by suicide. She drowns herself, right? And that's what the gravedigger is saying here. Is she to be buried in Christian burial when she willfully seeks her own salvation? Is she to be buried in a churchyard when she took her own life? That's not acceptable in Shakespeare's time. Um, or at least in the world of the play of Hamlet, that's that's not acceptable. She should not be buried in sanctified ground if she died by suicide. Uh, I tell thee, she is. Therefore, make her grave straight. The crowner, or the king, have sat on her and finds it Christian burial. Um, sat, I, is, is said, uh, sat on her and finds it Christian burial. All right, let's scroll down just a little bit and get a little more... Um, of this. So, so first of all, the, the, the second grave digger says, uh, if this had not been a gentlewoman, she should have been buried out of Christian burial. So the reason there's an exception being made because of her gentility and the king has said so. That's important. We're going to see a priest in a moment who disagrees with this as well. Um, so this is a bit of a controversy whether or not Ophelia should be buried in, sancti in sanctified ground in a churchyard. Um, then the grave digger, they, they switch topics, they get going, and this is where the, the first grave digger really shows his, his fun sort of wit. Before Hamlet shows up and they kind of have their battle of wits, right? The grave digger says, uh, he has a riddle. See if you can solve this riddle before uh, we get to the, the answer, right? Um, well, actually, you've, you've, read, you've read Act 5 before you watch this is the idea, so you do know the, the answer. But, but, but uh, it's, it's kind of fun to ask um, and see if you can solve the riddle beforehand. What's he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? So a mason's a bricklayer, so he makes brick houses. A shipwright is a shipmaker, makes ships to sail on the ocean. Carpenter makes houses out of out of lumber, out of wood. Which is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? So the second grave digger puzzles over this. Well, um, hmm, who is it? And he says, I know, I know. It's the gallows maker. For that frame outlives a thousand tenants. So that's a fun answer to the riddle. Uh, the, the best 
uh, strongest builder as a gallows maker because the house he builds outlives a thousand people who, who come to into the house to, to live there because a gallows is where you are you get hung uh, and uh, the, the first grave digger likes his answer but he's wrong that that's not the answer uh, and we scroll down a bit so they have a little bit of back and forth and finally the verse first grave digger reveals the answer says when you are asked this question next say a grave maker the houses he makes lasts till doomsday so if, uh, if the grave digger the houses he makes they last till the end of time till the return um, of Jesus right all the way to the end so therefore the grave maker is a better builder than the mason the shipwright or the carpenter um, this this little riddle gets caught in a lot of performances uh, just because he wants a long play it takes a long time so you have to find things to cut this doesn't really add anything to the story but uh, as, as we're reading it as we're thinking about it what it does add is it gives us a sense of the grave digger as a character and builds that character that very minor character up just a little bit so it's, it's sad when i see it cut in performance but this will be something that gets cut but but when you're reading hamlet don't don't skip over this take 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 the time to to enjoy and savor the grave digger now the parts but now the parts that, that don't get cut um is the exchange between hamlet so hamlet is walking along with Horatio comes upon the scene, sees the grave digger, and he's busy digging away, putting skulls up. So he's, he, as he's digging in the ground, he comes across skulls, sets them up on the side. In Shakespeare's time, it's a little bit different, a, a graveyard or a churchyard, in that you didn't necessarily have a place marked out just for you. So you would be buried, but there wasn't just your own spot where you were buried with your own stone necessarily. Um, so there was a lot of shared kind of space. And so when you dug one grave, it was entirely possible you would be digging up a couple of others and then you put them all back together. Um, and that's the, the part of the grave digger's job. So hence why he's digging up, he's coming across other skulls and he's gonna recognize and remember some of these skulls because he's been at this job a long time. All right, um, so Hamlet sees this, Horatio sees this, they see him singing, um, not being too serious about his work. And finally they, they approach. And they say, Hamlet says, whose grave's this Sarah? Sarah is kind of like Sir, but something a noble or a upper classman might say to a lower classman. It has a little bit of a, not a negative connotation, but just I'm talking to someone, um, an everyday person, right? Whose grave's this Sarah? And the grave digger, like Hamlet does with everyone else, this is the first time we see someone match wits with Hamlet. It says, mine, sir. Wait, whose grave is it? It's yours, huh? And, and, and Hamlet is sort of taken aback, but I think he's also probably a little bit, yeah, this, this guy's pretty smart, actually. He likes this kind of joke, this kind of humor. So I imagine him enjoying the, the witty uh, repartee that's about to happen. And uh, Hamlet says, I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in it. So you have to imagine him sitting in the grave um, uh, that he's dug, working there and and lying in it doesn't necessarily mean lying uh horizontal horizontally it could also be sitting in it sitting on the side of it in shakespeare's time that would have a little bit more of a, of a larger meaning but of course it does have the meaning the the second meaning that we still have today too so i could i can lie on a bed right or lay on a bed lie anyway <laughs> lay and lie is always a a, a fun fun one right uh, but anyway uh, i can lies and recline but also i can tell a lie an, an untruth right you lie and then and then this is where um he's you know hamlet's throwing it right back there with his double meaning this is his game he can do witty wordplay gravedigger responds you lie out on it sir and therefore it is not yours for my part i do not lie in it yet it is mine um so i'm not i'm not lying i'm in it right and i'm playing on this double meaning of whether you're lying or or telling an untruth whether you're you're in it or telling an untruth thou dost lie in it thou dost tell an untruth in it to be in it and say it is thine that's that's an untruth tis for the dead not for the quick you can't be alive and in, in your own grave quick means alive in shakespeare's time tis for the dead not for the quick therefore thou liest tell you tell an untruth and then he play uh, the gravedigger immediately in the witty wordplay picks up on that word quick says tis a quick lie sir so both quick as in alive 
Like the, but also the, the version of quick we still have in the 21st century of fast. Twas a quick lie, sir. Twill away again from me to you. Hamlet doesn't have a response. He's, he sort of is outwitted with the wordplay at this point. The grave digger is just as witty as Hamlet. And, that, and that's what makes this scene so lovely and funny and interesting. Um, and it's what makes the contrast of what's to come in a moment with the funeral so much more, so much sharper. Tis a, um, Hamlet goes back to his question. What man dost thou dig it for? Right? So he's repeating his question from up here now. Whose grave's the Sarabat? Okay, I'll reword it. You, you obviously aren't going to answer it this way. I'll reword it. What man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. Okay. For what woman, then? It's got to be a man or a woman, right? What, right? Could it be? For none, neither. Nope, not for a woman, neither. <laughs> okay. Who, so he's going to ask the question a third time, rephrase it, who is to be buried in it? And he says, one that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul, she's dead. So once you're dead, you lose gender is sort of the idea, right? And we still do that. We, we don't talk about usually a corpse as being he or she anymore. A lot of times a corpse becomes it. Um, so there's this interesting kind of word play here too. Uh, it's for someone who used to be a woman, but rest her soul, she's dead. So it's not for a man or a woman because a corpse, once you once you have died, you no longer have gender, um, or at least in this 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 kind of language play that we're playing with. You can imagine Hamlet taking a deep sigh. Okay, how absolute the knave is. We must speak by the card. We must speak very precisely or equivocation will undo us. Equivocation is speaking with double meanings, right? Um, equivocation is when you say one thing as a trick to really mean something else. All right, all right. And then, so he moves on. He's not going to get, well, he got an answer that it's a woman. He doesn't know who yet. We do. Uh, there's some dramatic irony. I think it's pretty, I mean, it's clear from their opening conversation. It's someone who died by, by suicide. We know who, who's to be buried here. Remember, but Hamlet doesn't. He's been away. He doesn't realize Ophelia is, is dead. Um, he, he moves on. Next question. How long hast thou been a grave maker? And the grave digger responds, of all the days of the year I came to it that day that our last king, Hamlet, overcame Fortinbras. That's important. So remember, um, Hamlet's dad and Fortinbras' dad, we've, we've mentioned Fortinbras just a little bit in these video lectures. I try not to talk about him too much, but he represents that, um, that international aspect of the play. And a long time ago, the two dads fought with one another. Hamlet Sr. on the side of Denmark won that fight over Fortinbras Sr. on the side of the, the Norwegian side. Uh, and, and, and hence, um, that, and that sets up, and actually that's going to set up at the end of the video lecture, I'll come back to that, but there was that battle between the, the two dads, right, over who, who has con political control of, of, of Denmark, right, um, and, and Hamlet's dad won that, so um, hence, Hamlet is, re you know, keeps being the old king and has all of his power, um, and Fortinbras Sr. got pushed away, another, another father-son, we've got several fathers and sons, Hamlet and, and his son, Polonius and Laertes, and, and Ophelia, not a son, but just as important or even more important as a character. And then, um, and now, for, and of course, Fort, Fortinbras and his father have been there throughout. Anyway, anyway, all that. Um, so the Gravedigger says that that's the day it happened. Well, how long has that been? Well, everyone knows that, the Gravedigger says. Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He that is mad and sent into England. Um, so the, the I've been, how long have you been a Gravedigger? Well, I've been doing it since that day that King Hamlet won his big battle against old Fortinbras. How long ago was that? Well, every fool knows that. That was the day that Hamlet was born. Young Hamlet, the one sent off into England. And so now Hamlet you know, takes the bait. Huh, why was he sent into England? And remember, the gravedigger doesn't know who he's talking to. It's not like today where you would have pictures of the king and queen and have lots and lots of photographs every day on the news or on social media, right? Um, it's, you know, he doesn't know that he's talking to the prince. He's just talking to, you know, or at least, at least we don't, you could do a reading where he, he's able to puzzle it together and figures it out because the gravedigger is smart. So that is a valid reading. There, there's nothing in the text that says for certain he doesn't. But if he does know, he's not letting on that he knows. Anyway, so, so Hamlet says, okay, why was Hamlet, um, who's not, who's, who I'm pretending I'm not Hamlet for a moment, I'm pretending to be just a regular everyday person, um, wh why was he sent into England? And of course, the gravedigger has a really nice joke because he was mad. 
he shall recover his wits there, right? He and, and remember that's why he was. He had murdered Polonius in his in his madness. Um, or at least that's the way it's perceived by the everyday people. And so he's been sent to England to recover his wits. Right? That's kind of the story that's been put around Denmark. Or if he do not, tis no great matter there. So if he, he's been sent to England to, to get better, get his, his mental health back on, on track. But if he doesn't, it doesn't matter there. Hamlet's like, well, well, why? Why would it not matter? And the grave digger, the first grave digger, and remember, it's only one grave digger. The other one, actually, I skipped over that part, but he left. So it's just the one grave digger, Hamlet and Horatio. And the grave digger says, it will not be seen in him there. There, the men are as mad as he. Which is quite lovely, because remember, this is a play by Shakespeare, an Englishman, and he's writing this play for English people to watch. Um, and so it's a little self-deprecating in a, in a fun, funny way. Um, he's saying everyone in England's crazy. We're all crazy here. And if Hamlet is crazy and he comes here, eh, nobody will even notice. It will be just fine. He's, he's more than welcome to join us. So so lots of, lot, a very a fun little scene. I've got an image, um, uh, an illustration. Let me pull this up. So this is um, an old illustration from 1828 um, by Eugene Delacroix. Croy, Delacroix, sorry, um, Eugene Delacroix, and you can see here, um, this is in a moment when we have Yorick Skull, we're, we're going to get there, but you can kind of see the idea of the grave digger lying in the grave, and remember I said it doesn't have to be lying flat, you can just be reclined in the grave, and that works. You can see here there are some stones to signify a grave, and also um, the funeral procession in the back, which we're just about to get to, I imagine this is Elsinore Castle in the background, so lots of little details in the back, but Hamlet, always dressed in black, Horatio looking at the skull of poor Yorick, Yorick. So this gives a sense of the of the scene quite nicely. All right, anyway, back to our scene. So the gravedigger, uh, they continue this a little bit longer, and then the gravedigger does pour, pull that skull up and says, this skull, so he's telling Hamlet, this skull, the same skull, sir, was Sir Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This? Ian that. Let me see. And so this is this is the famous moment of Hamlet, where Hamlet takes the skull and he gazes into the skull's eyes and looks at it. We saw it in the image just a moment ago. It's been done a hundred times in, in paintings and illustrations, probably a thousand times. Right, this is the iconic Hamlet image, looking at the skull. Um, let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. So you have to imagine him looking in. He's got a skull in his hand. I, uh, I need a prop for my video lecture. I don't have a prop of the skull. But if I did um, have one with me, it'd be, I'd, I'd hold it in my hand right now. And I'd be reading these lines as I look into the skull's eyes. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. So Yorick used to be the court jester. So he was a comedian. He was very funny. Fun. He hath bore me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. So my stomach rises, right? I mean, imagine if you were holding the hand, in, in your hand the skull of someone you, you knew as a child, someone you loved, cared about, right? It kind of makes your stomach rise up inside you. And that's what Hamlet's feeling right now is that, oh, that, that kind of, that moment of realize, oh, this was somebody I cared about, and look what he is, and now it's, it's he's gone. Um, and that memory, and that physicality of holding the skull in his hand. I have one one more image I want to show in this video lecture. Let me pull that one up. So I really love this one. Um, the other image, the image of Hamlet holding the skull, is the iconic one. Um, but here we get an image of young Hamlet. Um, this is uh, Calderon, 1868. And here he is, young Hamlet being born on Yorick's back, right? Playing. Um, you know, it's, it's a cute image. Maybe you've uh, held, a, a, you know, sh who, you've probably held a little kid on your shoulders or on your let them ride on your back before, right? It's a, it's a kind of a thing that we do with little kids. And Hamlet remembers being a little kid with Yorick. It makes it all the more powerful. Um, and then these other three women, I, I, we, I'm not, it's not clear. Paintings are sort of fun to, to try to piece together. I'm not sure which one is which. I'm guessing maybe this is his mom, Gertrude, maybe. Um, and these other, this woman is reading a book. I'm not sure what, but she's reading a book. And there's another little, little child. You know, the only other person I can think of in the play, really, that might be, would be Ophelia. Maybe Ophelia is a baby. Maybe Laertes is a baby, and that would be Polonius's wife, who, who is not in the play. 
but we assume she's some, somewhere in the in the story. Um, and maybe that, that's um, Ophelia's mom and Ophelia, maybe. There's a little dog here. I don't I don't quite know. There's no mention in the text of a dog, but if we're gonna we're gonna recreate this beautiful idyllic scene, look at it. it's on the it's on the water. Um, yeah, lovely. All right, let's get back to our our text now. So um, Hamlet talks to the skull a while, and and of course Horatio is there. Uh, the the grave digger is a little bit silent at this point. He doesn't have much to say, but but he says he's looking into the skull still. Says quite chap fallen. So a little bit of a joke. Um, your your chops or your chaps are right here. So he's either lost that part of his jaw. The skull has Yorick has, or it's fallen down. Either way, uh, quite chap fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her paint an inch thick to this favor she must come. So get to my lady's chamber. Um, I I actually think there's two readings here. I think I think you could read that as Gertrude's chamber. Um, or he thinks Ophelia is still alive. Get to Ophelia's chamber. Um, I think there's there's a, the possibility of either. Which what he means by my lady's chamber. And I suppose there, there's always more than two readings, but I think those two are the ones that most come to my mind. Let her let me let her go. Um, let your go to Ophelia. I'm going to go with Ophelia for the moment. Let her paint an inch thick. Let her put all the makeup on she wants. I haven't talked about that, this in the video lectures yet. This is the first time. Hamlet does not like women wearing makeup. There, there's um, some some stuff earlier. There's there's a couple of different points in the text. He thinks he thinks women wearing makeup that's a very fraudulent, fake kind of thing to do to appear as something other than you actually are. Um, anyway, anyway, uh, make her laugh at that. Pretty Horatio, tell me one thing. So you know, no matter how much makeup you put on, no matter what you do eventually you're like Yorick. You become a skull. He says, does thou think Alexander, referring to Alexander the Great, so from antiquity, from ancient times, Alexander the Great was the greatest of the Greeks, of, 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 of the Greek uh, warriors, kings. He was, he was, he was the greatest. Um, not, not from mythological sense. That would be maybe Achilles or Hercules or something, but, but of, of the time of like more recorded history of actual people that we know really were alive. Um, Alexander the Great. Do you think Alexander the Great looked of this fashion in the earth? And Horatio says, yeah, once he was in the earth, yeah, he looked like that. Ugh, and smelt so, because that's, that's the skull smells a little bit, right? Even so, my Lord. And then, you know, if Alexander the Great has to die and become a skull, if he can't avoid that fate, none of us can, right? And that's what Hamlet's getting to, right? To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he find it stopping a bunghole? So um, uh, a hole, right? Uh, you turn to clay eventually, back to clay, back back to earth, back to dirt. Um, and it can be used to fill a hole in a, in a wall or in a... In a um, Barrel, right? Twere to consider too curiously to consider. So, so this is kind of all of our response, most people's response when we start having these conversations, these existential conversations. Oh, uh, twere too, twere to consider too curiously to consider. So let's uh, let's not talk about it. Um, but Hamlet says, no faith, not a jot, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it as thus. Alexander died. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust. The dust is earth. Of earth we make loam, or, or clay. And why of that loam whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Right? The stuff that was once Alexander the Great becomes the stuff of, it becomes just clay. Dust. We return to that when we die. Um, and then line 220, note the switch. Um, we have been, uh, Hamlet has been speaking in prose, suddenly he switches to, to verse. Um, and always pay attention when Shakespeare switches from pro prose to verse. And then he says the same thing of imperious Caesar, referring to Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar too, um, the greatest of the Romans, was dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. The same thing. If Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great returned to dust, so do we. No matter how great we are, no matter how history remembers us, that's the end, like Yorick, like the skull. Um, very existential, um, very sort of a crisis mode of thinking about the, the shortness of human life. Anyway, all right. The reason I, the reason we switch to, to verse here, though, is because we've got the, the enter the king, queen, Laertes, and the corpse, and, and Hamlet doesn't know it, but it's Ophelia, along with a priest. Hamlet says, here comes the king, the queen, 
the courtiers. Who is this they follow? So who, who is to be buried? Who is this funeral for? And with such maimed rites, so something's wrong. They're not doing like the full funeral. They've left part, they're leaving. They're doing a very, very simple version. Why? This doth betoken the course they follow did with desperate hand for do its own life. Uh, so this is the kind of funeral you get if you die by suicide. Right, so he, Hamlet's a you know a, a master spy. He solves pu word puzzles. He un, he's kind of a Sherlock Holmes. He like is putting all these details together. And also, I think it's worth noting going back to its own life. Um, he doesn't know the gender of the corpse yet, um, but it goes back to that conversation earlier. Genders don't or corpses don't don't have gender anyway. Um, its own life. All right, so then he receives its Laertes. This is Laertes, a very noble youth. And Laertes says twice, what ceremony else here? Then he says it again here, what ceremony else? And he's talking to the, the priest or the doctor of divinity. And the, and the uh, priest says, you know, she, he, he died by, he, he died, or she died by suicide. So therefore this is it. And, and uh, Laertes is unhappy with this, but he can't. He, he wants a bigger, better funeral with all the extravagances that she deserves. Lay her in the earth, and from her fair and unpolluted flesh may violets spring. And remember, violets, um, back in Act 4, uh, Ophelia had said, the, the violets all withered the day my father died. So, so there's a nice little bit here by using violets as a flower for her. So before Laertes had called her the sweet rose of May, to a rose, but now may violets spring up. Everywhere Ophelia is associated with flowers, roses, violets, the flower that died when, when Polonius was murdered. Um, and Hamlet realizes who it is and he jumps, um, he leaps into the grave and him and Laertes uh, start to go at it. Hamlet says, I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. A little bit of hyperbole there, a little bit of exaggeration, 40,000 brothers. Anyway, the, you know, here's the thing. Did, you know, we have to ask questions of a production, and I, and I asked in the Act 3, did Hamlet and Ophelia have a sexual relationship? Uh, in Act 3 as well, we get Hamlet saying, I did not love you. Here he says he did more than 40,000 brothers could. And we have to ask ourselves, which one is the genuine version? Um, yeah, that's a decision to make as a director, as a reader. Um, both readings can work. You can read that he meant it in Act 3 when he says he didn't love her, and now he's just just sort of uh, putting on a sh extravagance. Or you can read this as more genuine. Or, you know, I, I think both readings can be right in the sense that human beings are complicated. We can be in love in a moment or fully know we're in love in a moment, especially when we've lost somebody who we mistreated. Um, and, and, and we can forget that sometimes, though, when we're heated, like he did in Act 3. So I think, I think both can actually hold. I think that's part of what it means to be human. Sometimes it's not so simple as he loved her or he didn't love her. Love is messy and complicated. Uh, all right. We're going to move on. Act 5, Scene 2. Oops. Act 5, Scene 2. Um, Hamlet and Horatio. Hamlet and Horatio are, are, have just witnessed the, the Gravedigger conversation, the poor, poor Yorick skull. Um, Ophelia has been buried, and now they're chatting. Remember, in Act 4, the king, Claudius, and Laertes set up their plan. They have three ways that they're going to get Hamlet. One, two, and three. They've got, a backup They've got a plan, a backup plan, and a backup plan for the backup plan. First of all, there's going to be a fencing match. And one of the swords, the one Laertes picks, is going to be unbaited. It's not going to have the little tip. So he's going to be able to stab and kill accidentally, make it look like an accident, uh, kill Hamlet that way. That's plan. That, that's the plan. Plan B is also that, that sword is going to have poison at the end. And that poison, remember, is so strong that just a scratch is enough to kill a human being. And then number three, the backup plan for the backup plan, uh, Claudius is going to have a cup, he's going to put poison in it, and they're going to give that to Hamlet as well. So certainly Hamlet will, will one of these will kill Hamlet. But first I have to get Hamlet to agree to the fight. And we get, um, well, okay. Um, I got ahead of myself just slightly, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down here, and I will come back to this. Ah, oh, shoot, I got ahead of myself. I wanted to talk about the 
Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, what happened to them. I'll come back to that. Let's just real quick look at Osric's line. He's going to come and, and get them, get, uh, Osric comes, he sort of has the, he, you know, we were just meeting Osric for the first time. He's a very minor character. He just appears here in the very last scene of the play. And he says here, the king, sir, had laid, sir, that in a dozen passes between yourself and him. And notice he, he um, this is prose. So, so Osric in some ways has replaced Polonius, but but he's, he must lack the nobility. Why, he doesn't speak in verse. Uh, so he, he's not as high stationed as Polonius had been. The king, sir, has, but he, he serves a similar function, and Hamlet messes with him with witty wordplay in a similar way as well. The king, sir, hath laid, sir, that in a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He had laid on twelve for nine, and it would come to immediate trial if your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. Uh, so here, Osric, remember, we know, there's this dramatic irony, the audience knows. Hamlet doesn't know, but he does suspect something. Um, this seems fishy. Why? Laertes is back. I killed his father, and now we're just going to have a fun little pretend fencing match that the king wants to do? Sounds, you know, sounds weird. It sounds fishy to Hamlet. Um, and, here, and here are the terms. Laertes is, is known as a really good, being really good at fencing. Better than, than most, better than Hamlet, right? His reputation is that he's better. So it's not even. Um, the king, sir, had laid that in a dozen passes, so they're gonna go, they're gonna have 12 separate little matches against one another. I don't know the right fencing terms. I'm not, I'm not very good at fencing. Someone who's good at fencing might have the, the right terms. But, but, but 12 passes or 12 matches. Um, Hamlet gets a, a handicap, though, of, of three. So that means he needs to win, if he wins four, with his handicap is seven, seven of the 12, he would win. If he can get four of the 12, whereas to Laertes to win, he needs to win nine of them. So to, because Hamlet gets three automatically. So, so right, um, it's a, so the odds, and Hamlet's gonna say, I think I can win at the odds. All right, pause real quick. We're gonna come back to the fight in just a moment. But first, um, I'm, I'm going slightly out of order. I wanna go back up and I just wanna mention what happened to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, so Rosencrantz and Guildenstern before, remember, Hamlet had come back, the pirates had saved him, brought him back, but Hamlet sent Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on uh, to England. And uh, remember, they had a letter from the king, and the king had was asking, requesting, ordering the English king, so the Danish king, that's Claudius, um, was asking the English king to take off Hamlet's head. Um, and we get that in the letter that in, up from my cabin, um, Hamlet comes up, he groped eye to find them, found the, the instructions, um, fingered their packet. So fingered is like a, um, he stole it. He stole their, their letter and withdrew to my own room again. And then he uh, unfolded the letter, their grand commission. And I found Horatio a royal knavery. An exact command, larded, with many several sorts of reason, importing Denmark's health and England's too, with, ho oh, such bugs and goblins in my life, that on the supervised, no leisure baited, no, not to stay the grinding of the axe, my head should be struck off. So I found the order from our king, from my uncle, that I was to be killed when I got to England. And Hamlet says, here's the commission, and he hands it to him. He still has the letter that, the, that King Claudius wrote to have him killed. And here is what happens to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You have to tell me if you feel sorry for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or not. I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. He still has the, the signet seal, so he seals it with, he has his father's signet seal, so he seals it with an official seal and sends Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on. This is the point where the pirates come, Hamlet makes his escape. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern get there. They either don't know what was in the letter, or they, they did know, but they think it's still the original letter. They don't realize it's been replaced. Um, and they get there, and... Um, the, the new letter says, on the view and knowing of these contents, without debatement further, more or less, he should those bearers put to sudden death. Um, so Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Um, anyway, all right, so moving on, moving on. So we're going to jump back over. I did that a little out of order. Hamlet's suspicious of the, the duel. He doesn't trust his, uh, he doesn't trust his, his, his uncle doesn't trust Laertes. He doesn't trust the whole situation. Denmark, you know, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. This is, it is poison. Um, and Horatio says, you know, you're going to lose. You, you, even with the odds, you can't win. But Hamlet says, I do not think so. Since he went into France, that was back in Act 1, since Laertes went into, went into France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at the odds. 
But Horatio says, you know, you know this sounds weird. This doesn't seem right. And he says, Horatio, at line 231, If your mind dislike anything, obey it. Trust your instincts. I will forestall their repair hither. Hither means here. And say you are not fit, not well. I'll, I'll tell them you're sick. I'll tell them that you can't do this duel. You should not go do this. This doesn't seem right. And we're getting near the end of the play. Hamlet's a long play. Um, yeah, it's getting near the end. So even the audience knows, you know, this this is a, this is a tragedy. Um, avoid the end of your own tragedy, I guess. But Hamlet says, no, I'm not going to. Not a whit. We defy augury. Augury are signs, right? Signs from above that might tell us to, what to do. No, we defy any kind of sign or prophecy or this little voice in my head that says, don't do this, um, that it's dangerous. No, there is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Providence means a, sort of a God-given fate, right? This is, God has a plan even for sparrows. This is a reference to a couple of uh, New Testament Bible verses, Matthew and Luke, Um Right, God has a plan for even sparrows. So if he has plans for sparrows, he's got a plan for you. And, and Hamlet at this point is ready to accept his fate, accept fate's plan, God's plan, providence's plan. It's whatever's to happen is to happen. And this is quite beautiful, what follows. And, and I think this, what follows, it's the answer to to be or not to be from act three. Hamlet was on the edge of, of dying by suicide himself um, here's the other answer. He does not is not going to die by suicide. He's going to live out his fate, whatever it is. He's going to embrace it. He's going to accept it. Um, there is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, tis not to come. My providence, my fate. If it's if it's to be now, then it means it's, my death is going to happen now. It's not going to happen in the future. If it be not to come. It will be now. If it's not in the, supposed to be in the future, it's supposed to be whenever it's supposed to be, it will be. If it be not now yet, it will come. The readiness is all. The readiness is all. What matters is that we accept and embrace things as they come to us and not try to uh, push against our fate to a point where we're not really living our lives fully. Since no man of aught he leaves knows, what is it to leave betimes? None of us know the day that we're going to die. So what does it matter if we live until today? If we live, if we die today, tomorrow, or a hundred years from now? No, we don't know when that date is anyway. So in between now and then, your one job is to live fully, right? And, and I think to be or not to be, I think we get the answer right here. Let be just be all right um i'm gonna move quickly um i am very quickly running out of time uh we get to the end of the play i'm going to skip over some of these things that i was going to look at laertes um picks the right foil the one that's unbaited the one that has the poison on it they have two bouts they start with two outs hamill wins them both he's not supposed to be, be better but he wins them both um and the king has has all the all those elements have played out the king has given um is trying to give give him the cup but Hamlet, this pearl is thine. He puts a the king puts a pearl in it, which is really the poison, into the cup. And here's to thy help. Give Hamlet the the cup. Hamlet doesn't drink it though. Instead, what happens is Gertrude drinks it, and and the king says, Gertrude, do not drink. And I imagine them on opposite sides of the stage. If he if he was next to her, he would have knocked it out of her hand. He he loved. I think he. I'm I'm certain. He loves Gertrude. Gen I think it's genuine. He doesn't want her to die, certainly. He doesn't want to accidentally poison her. But, but part of the whole thing, that word poison keeps coming up. He's poisoned by poisoning his brother. He's poisoned the whole kingdom. And here, he, the, you know, many innocents die too. Now Gertrude, she drinks it. And there's no saving her. He, the king tells us, the audience, and in an aside, it's the poisoned cup. It's too late. Um, they, they fight a bit. Um, she actually faints. Um, she swoons to see them bleed. No, it's the drink, my dear Hamlet. The drink, the drink. I am poisoned, and she dies. Now, just before that, during the third bout, um, they had exchanged rap rapiers, and Hamlet um, and Laertes are cut with the poisoned one, and they're both to die, too. That's how tragedy ends. Pretty much everyone dies at the end. And in the end, all we're left with is Horatio. Um, 
You know, I think Laertes' his last lines before he die are worth looking at, though, in our, as I rush to the end of the video lecture. He, the king, is justly served. It's a poison tempered by himself. Um, I don't know. Is Laertes to blame, too? Or is it just Claudius to blame for all this? Uh, I, that's a good question. One, one I don't have time to cover. Anyway, we get to the end. Hamlet's in one of his uh, last lines here. Um, Tell my story. As he as he as he dies too, and the same thing. Then um, his very last line: "The rest is silence." And Hamlet here dies. And Horatio's lines now cracks. A noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. And flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And and um, and that's the end of the play. Good night, sweet prince. And flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. We do get one last bit though. Fort and Bross, that minor character, and I alluded to him just a little bit earlier in the video lecture, he returns at the very end. And remember, old Fort and Bross, his dad, and old Hamlet, who's the ghost, had had out a fight a long time, time ago on the day Hamlet was born. Um, Fort and Bross, now that young Hamlet is dead, now that Claudius is dead, Fort and Bross is actually, as it turns out, is next in line. Everyone else in the play is dead, um, but we do find out Fort and Bross is to become the next king and he, he's got these lines i have some rights of memory in this kingdom which now to claim my vantage doth invite me and so ends hamlet uh thank you for watching these five video lectures i hope you've enjoyed them i hope they've been useful to you uh and uh look forward to uh to uh continuing into our our next thing together whatever that is